Production funding is provided by A. Reddix & Associates Health Information Resource Center, offering short-term training for long-term professional careers in medical coding. HIRCVA.net. Discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African-American community. This is Another View. Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Welcome to Another View. African-American skin tones cover the color spectrum from the lightest of light to the darkest of dark. During times of segregation, some very light-skinned African-Americans were able to pass. Thought to be white, they were able to enjoy the same privileges as long as no one knew their true identity. And then there was the paper bag test. Persons with skin darker than a paper bag were excluded from certain organizations and groups. In today's time, this hue of one's skin is still making a difference. Beyonce's skin lightened in ads for makeup marketed primarily to white women. O.J. Simpson's skin darkened on the cover of Time magazine to make him look more sinister. But here's the rub. Not only is there skin tone discrimination from outside the African-American community, but inside as well. It's called intraracial discrimination, and here to talk about it are Regina Malvo, Executive Director of the YWCA Southampton Roads, Eleanor Earle, Assistant Professor and Cinema Studies Coordinator at Hampton University, Cassandra Newby Alexander, History Professor at Norfolk State University, and Will Leviste, journalist, author, and roundtable pundit for Another View. Welcome to the program, everyone. Now, I have to tell you, this topic, when I talked to friends and told them that we were going to do this, one of the overwhelming reactions I got was, we're dirt airing our dirty laundry. Why are mm. you doing this? Are we airing our dirty laundry, Will? Actually, no, because one of the things that, that I think is important to understand is that all of the different groups have these kinds of issues. For example, you got Asian Indian community, skin whitening creams, very popular. Mm -hmm. You look at the Asian uh, community where you have an Asian eyelid surgery that is done. Um, you look at the fact that tanning salons, multi-billion dollar industry, why? Because people don't want to look pale. Mm -hmm. So it's an issue that exists across all the communities, but in our community, black community, because of the unique slave experience and things that have happened, um, there are some deep psychological things that are going on as well. So is it airing dirty laundry first? A lot of other communities deal with it, but if we want to really address the problem and, and move on, you have to be able to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But Regina, people have said to me, nobody's dealing with that anymore. What are you talking about? <laughs> there is no issue between dark-skinned people and light-skinned people. Um, I think you responded to a Facebook post I did one day where <laughs> I very personally was responding to a comment. Um, and as you know, I work with the YWCA Southampton Roads where our mission is eliminating racism and empowering women. So we continue dialogue around race um, quite often. And I can tell you that it's a very real issue. And you know, my friends who um, range the spectrum of hues within the African American community, um, all of us have, um, as you mentioned, sort of deep psychological um, uh, there is a deep psychological aspect of how we interact with one another and um, how we need to learn to interact differently and um, more lovingly with one another. Mm -hmm. Cassandra, let's talk about some of the history first. How did we get here in terms of this? Look at the rainbow we have here mm -hmm. on the set. <laughs> how did we get here? And, and actually looking at the rainbow tells you exactly how we got here. Um, the the transatlantic slave trade, really, the, the contact, the trade contact between Africa and between Europe. Um, this started a lot of intermixtures um, because the societies had, as they migrated out, they isolated themselves except for groups of people who were their neighbors. Um, one way you always control people, and we know that in the Middle East, this issue of color goes back to the ancient period. Mm -hmm. uh, people who read, even in the Bible, Songs of Solomon, there's a comment about, and it's a negative comment about a dark color, that you're, you're still beautiful, even though you're very dark. The, the, we, we know that there has been a lot of color consciousness for a very long time in human societies. Mm -hmm among some human societies, I should preface that. Mm -hmm. And we know that, that they've used these kinds of things, 
hair color, skin color, the shape of the nose or the lips as a way of defining either superiority or inferiority. And they're usually random, it's usually based on whoever has the power to then make this designation. So historically that's been the case. And then through the transatlantic slave trade, there was the justification that was given. And more so in America than in any other country, primarily because America like to say that it was standing for freedom, it was standing for opportunity. Long before Ellis Island was created and the Statue of Liberty was placed there, long before then, there were these ideas, and these ideas, of course, accompanied racial ideas. Uh, we know during the Enlightenment period of the 17th and 18th centuries that the, the, these concepts of you know, what constitutes a human being that's superior versus a human being that's not, and, it also and those characteristics. To do, too, it also got down to a point where, where the, the, the community in power also established who was what beauty was, yeah, and absolutely. Eleanor, I know we see that we've seen that a lot, particularly in films. Um, Most definitely, the images that are uh, portrayed in film and also in television reinforce the stereotypes that are associated with the skin tone and skin color that have come uh, through the centuries that are being mentioned here today. And one of the things that. I'm very interested in and some of the people with whom I work, like Monty Ross, who are formerly of 40 Acres and a Mule Filmworks, is how we as African Americans can work more behind the scenes and be the persons to help green light projects that will uh, provide more balance, if you will, mm -hmm. of these the images and all that we see. For instance, the, the film School Days dealt with uh, the issue of what we deal with of colorism and uh, racial prejudice or color prejudice within our own community mm -hmm. uh, with some very pivotal scenes. In As a matter of fact, I think we have a, a, a scene oh, great. from school days that we can show right now. So that was the whole thing about where they were looking at the dark-skinned girls versus light-skinned girls. Mm -hmm. I guess the question is, you know, you get it from the outside. We talked about some examples in the open where, you know, changing Beyonce's skin tone. Um, there are all kinds of examples of it from, from the outside community. But within our own community, you were, you were sharing some experiences, I don't know, that you've had um, as a dark-skinned woman. Um, yes. and, you know, you did a play. I did, actually. In 1999, I performed a play at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in Scotland. The title is, Who Told You Black Was Beautiful? And the reason that I wrote this way is because growing up here in Virginia, a lot of emphasis was placed upon my darker hue within uh, my family circle, not my immediate nuclear family, but say within aunts and uncles and things like that. Mm -hmm. And there was a difference, most definitely, in how I was treated at times based upon skin color. Things were actually said to me, and even in school uh, with other kids and all. And so throughout life, there was definitely growing up, I, I had some issues with um, being able to accept and love my skin tone. However, the good news is that I had uh, very loving parents who constantly told me how beautiful I was and all. Mm -hmm. And um, I went on to college at UVA and that was actually where, oddly enough, a place where you wouldn't think perhaps that I would have become really empowered about <laughs> being dark skinned and beautiful. But I did. I met people there who looked like me, actually, and who had made it to this uh, great institution of higher learning. I'm like, well, you're smart and you're beautiful. And I started watching how they positive they were about their looks and appearance. And I started experimenting with colors and all. That was another thing. I've been told you can only wear navy blue, brown, or tan. <laughs> Don't ever wear vibrant colors. And I started experimenting there and mm -hmm. uh, ended up enjoying it. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I want to play a clip very quickly, and I want to come back to this discussion. But mm -hmm. there is a documentary that's coming out called Dark Girls, and I'd like to show you a short clip from that, and we'll talk about it on the other side. She's the smart child, and why is she the smart child? Because she is white. Okay, show me the dumb child, and why is she the dumb child? Because she plays. Well, show me the ugly child. And why is she the ugly child? Because she's blind. Show me the good-looking child. 
and why is she the good looking child? Because she likes skating. My mother and her friend, and she's bragging on me. She said, my daughter is beautiful. She's got great eyelashes. She's got the cheekbones. She's got great lips. And then she's going on, and she adds, if she, could you imagine if she had any lightness in her skin at all? She'd be gorgeous. And just that last little part, just all that pride that I had about her, you know, having her brag on me, just dissipated. Just dissipated. And I think that that moment is when I really became aware. A friend of mine had recently had a baby. And so, you know, it was my first time seeing a baby and the baby was beautiful. And she said, girl, I'm so glad she didn't come out dark. And when she said it, it felt like a dagger, like someone took a dagger and stuck it in my heart because I was used to expecting hearing things like that from other races. But this was someone that I considered to be my sister. There are places I've gone that there are just a lot of whites, and they would tell me, you have such beautiful skin. Is that your hair? Did you dye? Is that your natural color? And, I, and you know, it's really questionable to me. Why is it that they think that I'm so beautiful and my own people don't see any beauty in me at all? I tell you, the first time I saw the clip from that, I, it just took my breath away. You know, I mean, let me ask the two of you first. I mean, can you relate to what they're talking about? Well, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, as a black male, and, yeah. you know, black at a berry, sweet at a juice, you know, I, <laughs> you know, just to lighten up the mood a little yeah. bit. So <laughs> I actually can remember my sister. Um, I have three sisters, one that I was raised with, going through a lot of that in mm -hmm. the 70s of being told that she's not pretty and, and so forth and those kinds of things. I remember that vividly. And... And having a daughter who is a lighter complexion, because my, my wife is a lot, she's actually a little lighter than my wife. Mm -hmm. I've told my daughter a lot that you are pretty on the inside. You are pretty on the inside. And when these issues of black and white and light skin would come up, I would always emphasize to her that it's about who you are on the outside. And just recently, she on went the to the prom. I mean, on the, in, on the inside, yes. Yeah. And just recently, she went to a prom with a young man, fine young man very dark skin and he often gets teased about being dark and so forth and she said to me you know it's just really a shame that people do that and, and we're still doing that because I believe people with dark skin are, you know are beautiful and that really made me feel proud because when I would tell her that I was thinking about my sister mm -hmm. and what she had gone through and how she had to overcome and get to a point of loving herself and mm -hmm. so it's heartbreaking to see that this is still going on mm -hmm. in this day and time after, you know, we went through a whole period in the 70s where black is beautiful and it's as if that whole context, that whole time is just, doesn't even exist Would for the you younger let me generation. Ask you this, because being a light-skinned person, I mean, can you relate to what they were talking about? I can, but in a much different way because I spent my formative years in um, Wyoming where there are very few black people. I was prominent as a black person with a little afro and so I very much experienced nigger this nigger that um, and very intense racial bigotry so I absolutely relate mm -hmm. and didn't feel light skin I just felt black mm -hmm. and I remember being and my father is dark skin and I remember um, being in probably the second or third grade and being angry with my dad for making me black because mm -hmm. um, it was my day-to-day -day experience in elementary school was so painful um, but then I will tell you, I think that I chose historically black institutions to study at both in high school and in college because I wanted to, because I only felt connected to and fully accepted by the African American community. And I will tell you that one of the most heartbreaking things for me was to, um, to come to my community and then experience that from the flip side where there would be um, some sisters who would not accept me as black. As and um, and mm -hmm. so one of the things I remember having a very vivid 
um, point, pivotal point at about 15 years old and deciding, um, you know, it just is so unfortunate that we as a people share this history of oppression, yet we are intentionally choosing to discriminate within our race. And then just making sort of a decision that day that I'm okay with me um, and I know who I am and I'm going to embrace other people who embrace me. Cassandra, how do you react to the, the thought that people say light-skinned people had received more privilege, got more of the breaks? You know, heard it all my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's uh, I've heard that all my life. Of course, I've also heard that because of my family, that you know I get all mm -hmm. these breaks because of that, not because of any hard work, not because of any talents or abilities that I've had. Mm. And and I was brought up understanding that was jealousy, that was envy. Um, it was everything other than something's the matter with me. Mm. And so my parents instilled in me that who I am, who someone is on the inside, is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. In my family, especially my mother's side, because people were light-skinned for generations. They were free blacks in North Carolina f as far back as I can go. And in North Carolina, they made people with, who owned property who were free blacks, they made them marry other free blacks or Indians oh. who were off the reservation and classified as mulattoes. They made them um, marry within that group if they wanted to keep their property. Mm -hmm. And so growing up with, on that side of the family, people were happy when you married someone who was darker skinned because everyone would say, thank God you're bringing color back into the family. So it was a, a very different environment for me. And, and I, I really embraced my blackness. I embraced my African heritage. Um, I tell people all the time, I grew up really a black militant. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the armband, the fist <laughs> raise, the whole thing. So did I. <laughs> and the poofy oh, afro, absolutely. <laughs> you know, because you had to tease your hair a little yes. bit to make sure that. Yes. <laughs> well, you had the afro pick in the back. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't do that. That was too thuggy. <laughs> to your point, Barbara, um, the privilege is real. And, um, I, um, it's, 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 it's not hard to accept, but it's hard to um, reconcile that it still exists. And there's no doubt that um, I think people who are my complexion and Cassandra's complexion um, often get um, opportunities in many ways that are not afforded to people oh, of darker that just skin. Them off. All right. And I mean, um, have you felt that kind of discrimination? Unfortunately, I mean, that, you, that you did not get something because of the skin tone. Unfortunately, skin tone. yes. And mm. I'll give a quick anecdote. Uh, I spent time living and working in Hollywood for a while, for about six years, and I remember uh, speaking on the telephone oftentimes with people in positions of power about my interest in working with them, etc. And I would go to have a meeting, and one time in particular, there's a, a well-known film producer in Hollywood uh, who agreed to meet with me. We'd spoken at length on the telephone. Upon arriving to meet with him, his mouth was agape in shock mm -hmm. when I introduced myself as Professor Eleanor Earle, whom he'd spoken with on the phone. And he told me directly, I never imagined that you were so dark. Mm -hmm. mm. And I remember just being stunned and greatly offended, but somehow I mustered enough strength to just sit down still with him and I, I ended up having a conversation with him about it because I guess in my own subtle way I was a little militant in that regard <laughs> uh, where I wanted to engage him in conversation about it, like how could you feel comfortable enough first of all to actually say that to me? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had a discussion about it and he was a Caucasian gentleman. Um, and. We went on to talk after that about still doing business, but it actually never happened. It was a it bit probably sour. left a bad taste in your mouth. Most too. definitely. How do we turn this around? We got two minutes, so <laughs> keep your keep your answer short. But but what do we need to do? And well, you kind of hit on it with the way you're teaching your daughter. Um, yeah, for example. I think that is, I mean, what do we? Need I think to that, do it, that that's very community? important. I mean, I've gone through this with my sons. I got two sons, and they've talked about the red bone thing from what they see in the videos and mm -hmm. you know I go back and forth I battle with them about it and mm -hmm. you know why I feel the way I do and why when it came to me when I was called blackie and this and that and the other was because of what my mother who's Dominican dark-skinned Dominican instilled in me and that is that you know you are beautiful and it's very important that you have parents who tell you 
that your beauty doesn't come from you know, your mm -hmm. skin tone, mm -hmm. that it comes from within mm -hmm. and who you are. One last word. Um, if, if <laughs> the question being, what do we teach our daughters about themselves so that no matter what their skin tone is, that they would be okay? Uh, absolutely, self-love. You are beautiful. Um, you matter, and um, and we also need to learn to tell that to each other mm -hmm. as yes, as definitely. adults, mm -hmm. because yeah. that's where it seems to be perpetuating itself. You know, uh, if you don't now. own who you are, then you end up being a pawn of other people. Mm -hmm. And so, it's taking ownership and claiming that important essence of who you are and once you do that then it doesn't really matter what other people say about you and on that note we're out of time thank you oh, all gosh. so much for joining me thank today you. on this our our last another view show on television so we're going to talk about that in just a moment but we'll be right back after this look at what's happening in hampton roads None of us have been immune to the changes in the economy, and that includes WHRO. As I'm sure you're aware, we lost state funding this year, and coupled with increased expenses, it has become necessary to make some changes. We sadly lost employees through layoffs, and we've come to the end of the production road for this show, as well as What Matters, which airs before us. Another View has been on the air for two and a half years, and I want to introduce you to some of the people who make it happen. Please welcome my co-producer and the person who brings you the wonderful positive stories each week, Lisa Godley, Robert Pittman, the director who makes the magic in the control room, and Kim Wadsworth, expert makeup expert extraordinaire, <laughs> who makes me look wonderful. Too bad you can't make me talk. <laughs> but welcome, you guys. And Thank I'm you. just so sorry it's under these circumstances, but we had a really good run, huh? Yes, we, did. we did. Absolutely. Yes, we did. Robert, I don't yes. know how the show's being done right now since you're out here, but yeah, yeah. we'll figure that out in a moment. Lisa, some of your favorite moments. There were a lot of favorite moments here. I loved being able to go out into the community and talk to people about what they were doing, look at some of the positive things that were happening in the African-American community. It just, I just felt good Absolutely. at the end of the show to be able to see that. We got to interview quite a few celebrities. Mike Tomlin came back home. We got to talk to him. Mm -hmm. um, of course, my, one of my favorite, Blair, Blair Underwood. <laughs> we got to do that. Um, it's, just been, it's just been so wonderful. Now, Robert, some people might say, well, you're not a black guy and you're working on this show <laughs> but you really got into the show and into a lot of the issues tell me what the experience was like um, for you I, I've really enjoyed doing this show I mean I like the pace of the show I like you know the guests we've had on the show are really good we've had the round tables are always like lively Absolutely. and stuff like that but I think you know when you do other shows I think you know the other stations just don't do shows like this and I think that that's what makes this show unique mm -hmm. you know it's it's a very good show. And, and Kim, you know, people think you just do my makeup, but it's so much more than I, that. I had the privilege of having so many fascinating people up close and personal. You know, my 15 minutes with them, a lot can happen. Uh, I'm allaying fears of people who have never been on television before. I'm finding about incredible people who are champion great causes, who are great community leaders. So many people that I wasn't aware of uh, who I was able to interface with and talk with them and get them excited or stir them up or listen to what they had to say and say, Barbara will love that. Don't forget to make that point. So I really felt that I was sort of behind the scenes getting people excited and appreciating the privilege of being able to share their insight and how they feel about their community and the causes that they're passionate about on a wonderful program like this. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, it's tragic because I feel like we have some great leaders uh, in this community, and uh, I'm going to miss knowing about them and knowing what they're doing and where they stand. Well, the great news is we will continue the conversation, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But Lisa, we really met the goal, and we got about 30 seconds left, but we really met the goal of our advisory group, do you think? Absolutely. Which was? Absolutely. We wanted to bring those issues that we weren't touching on in, in regular, you know, regular programming, regular mm -hmm. television stations. They weren't dealing with it. And you and I having that news background, 
we saw all the negative. We wanted people to see the positive. We mm -hmm. wanted them to see what was going on that was great in the African American Absolutely. community. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for everything you did to make this Thank show you. Thank so you. wonderful. We appreciate it. And as we said, there is great news. Another view is moving to the radio. Beginning July 15th, we will discuss the issues and celebrate the successes of the African American community for an hour every Friday on 89.5 WHRV-FM. We hope that you'll join us. That's Fridays beginning July 15th from noon to 1 on 89.5 WHRV. And on behalf of the production staff that makes this show possible, thank you, viewers, for your love. I'm so sorry, and your support. We are all so grateful. Normally, I would say, we'll see you next time for another view. And we will, this time on the radio. Take care. Production funding is provided by A. Reddix & Associates, Health Information Resource Center, offering short-term training for long-term professional careers in medical coding. HIRCVA.net.